So I was, I was lucky to grow up in, in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, at the base of Grand Teton National Park, Yellowstone National Park. And from a young age, I just loved going outside and running around in the backyard, flipping over rocks, looking at plants, catching bugs, catching lizards. And here I am 20 years later, basically doing the same thing, but for a living. Here at Western Washington is the Arctic Alpine Research Laboratory, and it's one of the few places in the United States that's doing this type of research that we're doing. My team and I do research on alpine and arctic systems in an attempt to understand what climate in the past has done to lead to the diversity of organisms that we see today, as well as how changes in the future in climate and environments might impact the distribution of those organisms, where they are, and if they are able to persist. As a result of climate change, it's pretty well known that alpine species are losing habitat. As temperatures warm, they're forced up in elevation. But what's less known is there are indirect effects of climate change, which are changes in disturbance patterns, things like pathogen outbreaks, like pine beetle or flooding. What I was most interested in was wildfire. So what we wanted to unravel is that in conjunction with the direct effects of climate change, increases in temperature, that increased fire frequency at high elevation is going to lead to more rapid destruction of alpine ecosystems. Here is a historical record of Saxifraga ostromontana. So sax means rock and frage means to fracture. This group of plants lives in cracks and crevices in rocks. It is a cushion plant, so it grows really low to the ground. It has thick, leathery, spiny leaves, which help it retain water throughout a dry season. And then in the summer, it grows these stalks with really, really beautiful groups of flowers. They're about dime size, they're cream colored. They have these beautiful red, orange, and yellow spots on them to attract pollinators. So this is one of about 1,500 historical records we have of this plant. And we use these records to locate historic populations, which we can put on a map. And then we can go back and revisit these populations uh, in this instance, um, almost 70 years later. Essentially, we mapped out all historic herbarium records of this plant to see where it grew in the past. Then I mapped out all large recorded wildfires from 1984, overlaid them in geographic space and located 31 historical populations that had been burned over by wildfires. For each historical population that's been burned, I paired it with an unburned record, which had the same characteristics, the same collection year, the same mountain range. And then it was our goal to go and visit those paired sites across the entire latitudinal range of the species. My name is Matt Knipp. I live in Bellingham, Washington now, uh, originally from a small town in central Illinois, 5,000 people, country town, real rural. I was so stoked, yeah. <laughs> I was so stoked to have Matt on board. Um, yeah, so, so Matt and I already had a good relationship through climbing, and the fact that this was gonna be mutually beneficial for both of us, I just knew it would be an awesome adventure. I mean, it was definitely a perk that this trip would present uh, possibilities to climb in all these different areas that you know many people wouldn't get to. This project provided a unique opportunity to explore these alpine environments across Western North America. And we thought, well, we're already in these awesome places. We might as well make it a goal of ours to rock climb in every state and every province that we pass through. So first, we decided each location we were gonna go beforehand, got the GPS coordinates, and downloaded the topographic maps for that site. Then we compiled all the gear that we would need, camping gear, climbing gear, bear spray. Uh, I've done some car camping, but really never lived out of a backpack or a car for that long. And honestly, I didn't know really what to expect going into it. I just, I trusted Trevor as, as a leader and a partner and, and I just kind of went along with it. We took off from the state of Washington and headed out towards Idaho. Our first mountain that we climbed was called South Loon Mountain. It was about a 16 mile round trip. How you doing, Matt? Pretty good, dude. It's 
been a long hike, but we got it. We made it. Got to the summit, celebrated, and then on the way back, the uh, that's when it really hit. You know, I was I was sore, my feet were hurting. How you guys feeling? I was ready to be done. Quit. I was a little worried that, you know, it, it was gonna be this intense and this hard every day. After that, Idaho went went pretty smoothly. While we were in Idaho, we stopped by the City of Rocks National Monument and climbed some awesome granite flakes. So after Idaho, we headed south to Colorado, southern Colorado, um, and we ended up in Durango. And that's when collecting started getting, getting a little bit more difficult and our, our pace picked up. We visited 25 alpine sites in 18 days. So sometimes that meant climbing two mountains in a day and no days off. <laughs> Hello, Lewis. You Hello, Clark. <laughs> At each field site, we had to hike in. When we got to a site, we went to the, the coordinate that was provided by the historic record. And then we started what's called a time-based search of one hour, which means we put in one hour of search effort at this particular site. If we locate the population, we start to record measurements. We record how abundant is the plant species, where is its greatest density, and then we take collections for, for historical records. We take soil samples to analyze for the presence or absence of charcoal to determine conclusively if a fire was there or not. And we take a substrate sample to learn a little bit more about what sort of rocks these plants are growing on. But the most important thing we're interested in is, is the plant there or is it not? And if it is there, how abundant is it? We are hiking on East Spanish Peak, which was a burn site. We sampled oh, and we, I think we're having lunch, just getting ready to go back down and then a, a thunderstorm rolled in. And so what happened, in about 15 minutes, the entire forest started flooding. Fires, after they come through, actually the waxes in the leaves that make leaves hydrophobic, so leaves don't soak up water, go into the soil and the soil actually becomes hydrophobic. We were sprinting across like open sections of forest, you know, just to get under the trees. So it was kind of a panic. As we were traversing the Rockies and, and spending about half the time in these, these burn sites, we just witnessed firsthand both the beauty and the, the destruction of these wildfires. At lower elevations, it's really beautiful to see post wildfire these amazing meadows and all this plant diversity coming back and even animals using the burn sites. But when we're going up in elevation, what we're seeing is that these high elevation ecosystems, some of these plants are hundreds of years old. When they burn, they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm just watching the sunset. There's a ton of fish in this lake. From Colorado, we headed across the Wyoming Basin to my hometown of Jackson, Wyoming, where I was able to do some public outreach with the community out there, go fly fishing, and we also climbed the Grand Teton, which was my highlight climb of the trip. I've climbed it before, but that's one of my favorite mountains in the entire world, and it was awesome to share that with Matt and also my friend Ian. Frank Church Wilderness of No Return is the, the largest wilderness land in the lower 48. It's also one of the most remote. We did a backpacking trip. It was three or four days and it was pretty miserable. We headed to Missoula, Montana for about two days of civilization. It kept us sane, you know, did some climbing, of course. I went and visited the Missoula Smoke Sciences Fire Laboratory and also the Missoula Smoke Jumper Museum. From Missoula, we went to the Bob Marshall Wilderness. From there and in northern Montana, there were several sites we only weren't able to get to three. And the reason we couldn't get to them is because they were currently on fire. 
in the months of September and October, I was able to round out all the collections in Washington now that the snow had melted and got back into the high country with our final site being on October 17th, Prussic Peak in the enchantments of the Alpine Lakes Wilderness of Washington. We got it done and you know nobody was eaten by a bear we didn't get washed away in floods or struck by lightning so i mean it felt it felt really good to finish like for me like personally i felt for the first time i was doing science that i i really believed in um, but it took about a year and a half of data analysis and writing to get this project to completion so first what we had to do is enter all the data that we collected over five months into spreadsheets we ran analyses to see if you go to a burn site versus an unburned site, what is the likelihood that you're going to find the population? And what we found is that burned sites had about three and a half times greater likelihood of extinction of a local population than an unburned site, indicating that wildfire is leading or could lead to local extinctions of, of these alpine species. But once we answered our initial question, we then used that information to inform climate change models. And what those climate change models are showing us is that alpine species are going to lose about 40 to 80% of their habitat in North America by um, the middle to the end of the century. That's just based on temperature and precipitation, but what if you add wildfire as a disturbance to those models? So we used ArcGIS to design a fire and climate predictive model to see in the year 2050 where the spotted saxifrage is likely to be able to persist. So um, in, in just about 35 years from today, this plant is gonna lose about 40% of its overall range, which is huge. This trip was a huge reminder of, of how much I love being outside and also of a reminder that, that I'm really fortunate to, to get to go outside because we go to these places and, and sometimes we don't see anybody there. I think it's really important to go and see where water comes from, where natural resources come from, and to realize that, that these places are, are finite. You know, we're, we're in this amazing time. It's a wonderful opportunity um, to be here uh, when this change is happening. You know, it's, it's an opportunity to make sure that you get out and you, you get up into the mountains and you see them now because they're going to be different um, in the very near future. They're different now than they were 10 years ago already. Um, you know, classic example is Glacier National Park is going to be the park without glaciers, you know. It's kind of ridiculous. So I think it's important for us to get outside and when we're enjoying these natural spaces that we might already be recreating in, think about it from a conservation standpoint as well. The more that I know about a place, the more I want to know about that place and the more I'm stoked about being in that place. And then that's when that, that interest and that excitement for a place turns into, wow, I don't want to lose this place. What I think is really important is, is just forming a personal connection with nature, getting outside, and seeing what the world has to offer. Because if you don't know what you stand to lose, you're not going to stand up in the fight to protect it.